delay. Apologies to all our patrons and all our, our panelists as well. Um, nevertheless, I'm sure we're in store for a, a great discussion. And um, I just want to introduce myself briefly. David McCandless, Director of Shakespeare Studies at SOU. I'm also the presenter of events for Shakespeare America, which is a consortium of educators and artists from SOU and the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. We've done some uh, events in the past, like Multicultural Shakespeare, Women's Part in Shakespeare. You've probably come to some of these. I hope you have. Interviewed Peter Sellers and Bill Rausch. Had a great discussion last year with some directors talking about restaging Shakespeare in the 21st century. So I want to get right to introducing the panelists for our event, African American Shakespeare, Past, Present, Future. Just let me also say that we will be taking questions at, at the end, towards the end, probably more like 620 than what we might have originally envisioned given the late start. Um, but I'm sure uh, you can be dropping questions in along the way as well. And, and uh, don't hesitate if something occurs to you, just pop it in there. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first panelist, L. Peter Callender, who will be familiar to Shakespeare enthusiasts from the Bay Area. I was at Berkeley for a while and uh, saw Peter perform many times at the California Shakespeare Theater, where he's been a associate artist for uh, over 20 years. He's also the artistic director of African American Shakespeare Company, has performed on and off Broadway at major regional theaters and especially <clears throat> native of Trinidad, a graduate of the Juilliard School, L. Peter Callender. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. I appreciate that. Very welcome. Uh, uh, next two uh, panelists will be very familiar to fans of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. They've both been fixtures there. The first, Jenny Greenberry was a member of the acting company for five years. She performed such Shakespearean roles as Ophelia and Hamlet and Marina and Pericles, the latter production taking her to Washington, D.C., the Shakespeare, uh, the Folger Shakespeare Theater, and uh, also at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, where she subsequently performed Roxanne in Cyrano de Bergerac. I also must say as a fan that I will remember her non-Shakespearean roles as well as I'm sure many of you do, including Belle and Beauty and the Beast and Polly Potter in the Marx Brothers musical, The Coconuts. Welcome, Jenny. Jenny Greenberry. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. I also want to just Don Monique Williams, who's another OSF stalwart, having worked there for many years as artistic associate and having directed The Merry Wives of Windsor in 2017. And she was all set to direct this really interesting play called Bernhard Hamlet last year. And alas, the pandemic happened and, and the production didn't, sadly. Uh, she's now a uh, Associate Artistic Director at the Aurora Theater in Berkeley. Welcome, Don Monique Williams. Hi, friends. So good to see everyone again. Thank you, David. You. And finally, we have a major scholar here, Ayanna Thompson, who is Regents Professor of English at Arizona State University and Director of the Center, the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. She's also written some five books and uh, edited four volumes of essays, most of them on the subject of Shakespeare and race. She's also a scholar in residence at the Public Theater in, in uh, New York City and uh, is chair of the Council of Scholars at the Theater for New Audience in Brooklyn. She's also on the uh, board of Play on Shakespeare. Welcome, Ayanna Thompson. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Thank you. So I think uh, Oh, just, I would just like each of you to, to describe your own experience with Shakespeare, as in when did you come to know Shakespeare and get involved with it, with him, with his plays, his work? Uh, early, late, middle? Was it easy, difficult? And I thought we could just use the order of introductions for a order of response for this. <clears throat> well, thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, what a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is L. Peter Callender. As David said, I'm the Artistic Director of African American Shakespeare Company in San Francisco. Um, my introduction to Shakespeare uh, was, um, was very early. Um, like my uh, fellow countryman, um, Errol Hill uh, from Trinidad, who wrote uh, the wonderful book Shakespeare and Sable. I'm a native of Trinidad, West Indies, and um, I lived in London for a number of years. And when I came to the States in the, the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, I had some great, I had a great teacher, Barbara Glickenstein um, at PS80 in the Bronx. And she took us to lots of theater. We did lots of theater in her class. 
And I think that's where I got my, my thirst and my desire for theater uh, specifically. But it's when I went to High School of Performing Arts, the FAME High School in New York, that's when I really decided, I, it was, it was <laughs> to coin a phrase, thrust upon me um, by a wonderful teacher named Roz Shine um, and uh, Ruth L. Kohler uh, at Performing Arts High School. And that's when I got the taste, the yearning to, to read Shakespeare and perform Shakespeare. And I had a, a, a keen understanding, an early understanding for Shakespeare. Um, I would get stopped in the hallway after a math class or after a boring Spanish class or history class. And Miss um, Shine will say, I, I need for you to memorize the first prologue to Henry V by next Thursday. And it's Tuesday, you know? And I would, I would hustle home and forego all my other homework and um, memorize Oprah Muse of Fire. And uh, she would critique it and give me notes. And that was, that was when the bug uh, hit me really, really hard. And I loved the, the language. I loved the rhythm. I loved the muscularity of the, the language itself. Um, and uh, then, of course, um, Jim Moody was um, the first African-American actor um, in the first group at the Juilliard School. Um, and he came to teach at Performing Arts High School and he became my mentor. And that was it. That was the, that was the shot in the arm. That was the kick in the you know what. That was the, the slap in the face, whatever you want to put it. That was it, because this man spoke so eloquently, um, uh, carried himself uh, with, uh, with deportment and style and grace. And, and I wanted to be Jim Moody and I wanted to be that type of, of presence in a room. Um, and he coached me and I got into the, to the Juilliard School and that was it for me. Uh, and uh, now 23 Shakespeare players, plays later, um, directing about seven of them. And now the, I'm the artistic director of the African-American Shakespeare Company. So I've come a long way, but that's when I started. It started early and I'm blessed to have been touched um, and um, served by such brilliant people in my high school age. That's fantastic, and I can't believe I have to follow that. Um, <laughs> well, in my time at Yale with Meryl Streep, uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, so <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I was first introduced to Shakespeare, I think like many students in the US, um, <clears throat> pardon me, in my high school English class, freshman year. Um, and I just remember thinking, wow, this is the most boring thing I've ever read in my entire life. Why do we care about this? Um, it was just, uh, I think it was just prevented or prevented. It was presented in a very dry scholarly type of way, um, that was completely devoid of the richness of Shakespeare's language and the musicality of it. Um, so I kind of just, you know, plotted along and in, in my, <laughs> my English classes in high school. Um, and when I became a professional actor, um, I knew that I mostly wanted to focus on musical theater. Um, I am a musician. Um, I think if you, you cut me, I bleed in, in music and <laughs> it's my first language. Uh, I sing, I do play several instruments um, and that's what I really wanted to focus on. And um, it wasn't until, uh, actually I got to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival where I got to work on Pericles with Miss Don Monique Williams, <laughs> who was assistant directing, and uh, Joe Hodge, who was our director, um, that I was first exposed to the brilliance of Shakespeare's language. And for me, uh, what hooked me into that was really the musicality of his language and just how, it's like a song. All of Shakespeare's works for me, when I when I read them and when I perform it, it's like, it's, it's all musical, it's just performing in this, this incredibly lyrical language uh, and and I love it and I'm really grateful that I was able to kind of study under the mentorship of Dawn and Joe um, and of course our uh, voice and text coach in that production Rebecca Clark Carey who is still uh, an amazing mentor to me I still call her with this day to any questions I have about about certain Shakespearean texts um, but that really kind of turned my whole perception of what Shakespeare was and could be around um because of my schooling it was just oh yeah it was rough but uh but i'm very pleased to be um kind of firmly rooted and entrenched in classical works today and i cannot wait until this pandemic is over and we can get back to 
more of, of Shakespeare's work. <laughs> love that. I love that I was there for your first um, deep dive into Shakespeare. Jenny, I remember we did two Shakespeare's that season because we also did Antony and Cleopatra. So, um, and I remember how shocked you were that like, I'm not doing school for this season. Um, but um, Jenny was also in the Merry Wives of Windsor that I directed. So um, as as she and I agreed, they're all musicals. They're all musicals. Um, like Jenny, I was introduced to Shakespeare in school. I remember being seventh grade and, and being required to read Romeo and Juliet. And I didn't. Um, I didn't understand it. I didn't see how it applied to me. I was not a fan at all. I remember my mom like taking me to Blockbuster when those were a thing and like we rented like West Side Story. And she was like, it's, this is basically Romeo and Juliet. Um, so I spent my like formative years really hating Shakespeare actually. And it wasn't until um, I, I was doing conservatory program in San Francisco at ACT. Um, where I acted Shakespeare for the first time under the tutelage of Tommy Gomez. Um, and that's when I sort of uh, experienced a shift and fell in love with Shakespeare. It was in the playing of it. Um, and I wasn't, wanted to be an actor back then. And Tommy said, you know, more, act, more actors of color get work doing Shakespeare um, than anything else. So um, you should learn to love it. And, and I actually, um, did and then that carried with me into my transition into being a a, a director and um, sort of now made a career out of directing uh, classic plays and uh, as the people on this call know I have multiple Shakespeare themed tattoos um, I've showed them off in webinars <laughs> already so, um, I love that it's like the unveiling of, of Dawn's tattoos. <laughs> um, so I think my story might be slightly in between these. Um, I grew up in a household with um, a parent who loved Shakespeare, but I, you know, we were working class, so I didn't go to any plays. And then one year randomly, my mother came into some money and we went to, to England and I was 13 and all I wanted to do was hang out in London and like with the punk rocks and you know, like I was like, yeah, the clash. I, you know? <laughs> and, and she's like, and it, as part of this trip, we're going to go to Stratford upon Avon, Shakespeare's birthplace. And I was like, why? No, no, <laughs> this is like the antithesis of cool. Um, and she got us tickets to Romeo and Juliet starring Sean Bean as Romeo and Neem Cusack as Juliet and, and <laughs> Hugh Corshi as Tibble. So, and they were in leather and riding motorcycles around. And I was like, I don't know, this is kind of cool and sexy and they're all so hot. And so I just kind of had that in my back pocket. Like I didn't think of myself then as a Shakespeare fan. And certainly by the time I got to high school, Jenny, I think I had the same ex experience, except for I'm sure I'm a lot older because we listened to Hamlet on a record. <laughs> and it like, it was deadly. It was like the worst kind of thing. But still I had this poster in my room of Romeo and Juliet from the RSC. Um, and then, you know, by the time I was doing my graduate work, I, I ended up like kind of working backwards in time to get to the Renaissance because I was interested in the history of constructions of race. And then I was like, but these plays all have, like, you know, reading Titus Andronicus in college, I was like, it's all right here, everything we're talking about. So, so yes, so that's, that's my trajectory. Well, thank you. You know, one of the things I had in mind listening to your, your narratives and describing your, your trajectories it was uh, something I read that Tim Bond said. Uh, Tim Bond used to, I think, was the associate district director under Libby Apple. And he talked about actually feeling like he was a Shakespeare's language and world were not for him, or he didn't feel welcome. Um, he overcame that and came to think that it was actually a sort of a a blueprint or a foundation for a very global and diverse world. But initially you said he felt unwelcome. Did any of you experience that at all? I'm not, I'm not hearing that. Is that, is that not really the case for any of you or? You mean I, being, being not welcomed? Well, in other words, did, 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 somehow this particular 
artist uh, felt like, well, the Shakespeare's not really for me, or I'm not welcome. The language well, roles are not are not for me, and I'm not, I'm not welcome in it. I'm not. Well, not that yeah, me. I mean, very briefly, I'm I'm sure the other panelists will have a more in depth response, but. Uh, very briefly, when I was growing up in New York, again, performing arts high school and the Juilliard School, there was a reviewer by the name of John Simon. Uh, everyone's nodding Infam their head. Infamous reviewer. The infamous reviewer, John Simon, who basically said, and then I am probably paraphrasing it, but I'm sure he said it sometime in his life, that uh, black people should not do Shakespeare. Either our lips were too big or no, whatever. We, could, we just could not form the language. We couldn't speak the language properly. Um, and that lit a fire under my butt like nothing else in the world. Um, just reading his material. I used to work with um, Vinette Carroll and the Urban Arts Corps. That's how old I am, my Lord. Um, but she influenced me greatly. And I remember we were going on a TV interview show. I was one of her assistants. It was the WNEW um, Bob somebody. And um, John Simon was to be on the panel. And Vinette Carroll got there and she said, I, re I refuse to be on this panel with John Simon. Um, and uh, she, we walked, we walked away because John Simon said we couldn't do it. And he was one of the, the most uh, read, one of the most read uh, critics of the time. And so many people listened to him. Um, he actually spoke of, um, of black dancers when Alvin Ailey was doing his thing in New York. And uh, of course, <laughs> the premier ballerina of the world is Missy Copeland. So we are, <laughs> we've, we've come a long way. But yeah, we were told that we couldn't do this. And um, um, I, I am here because of my teachers, but I'm, I'm here because I, I, I disagreed with that wholeheartedly. And I, I think Shakespeare is universal. Um, the plays are written for us, the plays are written for everybody. Um, and I, I never once thought that I could not do this work, never once. Um, and I am, you're right, Ayana, incredibly infamous man uh, who wrote horrible reviews of people, spoke of their features and spoke of their height and their weight, it's just awful. But that's the person that said, that's the only person that I've ever heard tell me that I could not do Shakespeare. Well, it's interesting that he fueled you because he fueled me too, because um, when I read those reviews, I was always like, how is it that someone this, you know, kind of explicitly racist was allowed to continue and have this storied career as a theater critic? And how is it that there weren't other voices counteracting yeah. that opinion? And so yeah. for me, I was like, what's going on with the history of casting in Shakespeare? that this is allowed to, to go on for decades. It wasn't like one or two nasty, it was over and over again for decades. So we, we are fueled equally by the desire for revenge. <laughs> yeah, I quoted both John Simon and Tim Bond in my um, grad school thesis. So, I mean, uh, Simon, you know, one of the, the quotes from him was on Denzel's performance in Julius Caesar, which was just in the 90s. So, I mean, he really, he really had a very pervasive and hateful um, career. But to your question, David, I didn't feel like I belonged at all. It actually felt, I mean, I, and I had like a, like a, a sort of a more militant ideology when I was in high school too. I went to Berkeley High. It was the only high school in the country at the time to have a black studies department. So I really felt like um, like the narratives written by dead white men just were really not for me, were not applicable. Of course, we were watching horrible film versions too. So so I, I would have never conceived of a career um, doing Shakespeare, dedicated to Shakespeare. And I even knew I wanted to be an actor back then. I've always wanted to be in the theater since I was six years old. So, so I, I never thought that. What I did think, is that I would do like August Wilson. And at the time when I was graduating high school, August Wilson had also just recently engaged in those debates and had done the ground in which I stand, where he said, black actors shouldn't be doing Shakespeare. So to further complicate it, I was like, well, you know, this playwright who is writing for people like me says we shouldn't be doing it. So, um, so it really wasn't until I took that training program um, and had an acting teacher who was Chicano and had like a completely breakdown moment, like, well, all I ever play is like the ch 
chubby next door neighbor or like drug addicted people. And he was like, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta bone up on your classics. Um, and it was really motivated by, by that, um, to be honest. Yeah, I definitely um, never felt like Shakespeare's works were for me. I didn't feel like I was invited to that table uh, because of the color of my skin. And also because I think there's a bit of like a, a classist element to it, where at least as I perceived it um, coming up in my education, it was sort of like, well, Shakespeare's for the highly educated elites and for, you know, the very well to do and I was like I don't that's not me and I don't really want anything to do with that so you can keep you know this strange dusty dead person that doesn't speak in a vernacular anyone has used colloquially since you know the 17th century um and I also just didn't I never saw anyone that looked like me doing these Shakespeare plays um I've been a drama kid you know, ever since I can remember. So coming up, even through like middle school and high school, you know, you see these plays and it was just like, I don't really, I didn't see myself reflected in these characters or in these casts. And so it was like, okay, this is, you know, something we check off for our field trip assignments and then back to the classroom. Um, so there was definitely an element of uh, kind of feeling like this is not, this is not for me. So I can just uh, kind of <laughs> take a back seat. Um, but I, I'm so, so grateful that, uh, I had people and mentors that were able to kind of peel the lid back on that for me and say, no, 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 this, you know, you all talk about the universality of Shakespeare. It really is for everyone. Um, and that's what I hope more young people of color pick up and take with them moving forward because boy, do we need them. I, I will say that, um, because I alluded to reading Titus uh, in college, and I think I had like an aha moment because my professor was like a super famous, you know, ancient guy then, <laughs> like, um, and then taught for many more years. But but he he was completely unwilling and unable to address all of the explicit themes and issues around race in Titus Andronicus and wanted to dismiss it as juvenilia. And so for me, I did see, since I had a huge background in African-American studies and post-colonial studies, I was like, oh, but this is all about empire building. And like, this is actually looking like an empire about to collapse and race is in the middle of it and there's slavery and there's a biracial baby. Like, so, so I felt like I had a toolkit that, you know, was, you know, had been forged in African-American studies that I was able to uh, use when reading Shakespeare that my professor was unable to. So for me, I kind of felt like, oh, wait, I, I know it's something that you don't know. So it didn't feel as alienating, but it was only because I had that, you know, that other toolkit. Great. You know, last year I, allu I alluded to the panel discussion on directing Shakespeare in the 21st century that we had last year. And one of the participants, Rosa Josh, had said that she felt like the future of Shakespeare was was definitely uh, uh, people of color. Uh, that, 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 you know, that's exactly what the theater needed right now. And I was struck by, um, I guess it was Don who said that somebody said to her, your, your mentor at ACT perhaps, who said, oh, well, you need to get into Shakespeare. That's where all the parts for people of color are. Um, so on the one hand, I, you know, this, it's interesting. On the one hand, I've certainly heard uh, other African-Americans say that they, they felt alienated for and unwelcome. On the other hand, we have, it seems, uh, a situation where there are actually lots of opportunities. Is that, is that overstating the matter? Uh, when I hear someone say the future is, is BIPOC actors and, and I see the diversity of productions at OSF and, and in New York sometimes, uh, places as well, I'm sure. Is, is, that, uh, is that reassuring? Uh, to, to, to all of you, or, or do, you, uh, do, do you feel I like... I think it's nuanced. I think it's nuanced. Um, this was in the 90s when my mentor was saying there's a lot of opportunity, and we were still sort of on the, like, colorblind casting train. And in regional markets like uh, the San Francisco Bay Area or, like, New York, where, the, where Joe Papp was casting a lot of people um, at the public, you would see people of color in these Shakespeare plays. And 
far more than you would in a in the sort of other kind of precious western canon like far more than like Tennessee Williams or Arthur Miller or Eugene O'Neill it doesn't necessarily mean that they were the leads it doesn't mean that they were being cast well they might still be playing into you know negative stereotypes or tropes or certainly still in the minority but the opportunity um certainly for a professional actor to get some work weeks and have some health insurance uh did exist more with those plays because people could somehow wrap their head around this notion of colorblind casting as applied to that um and i i know i'm sort of going to just put i on the spot a little bit because i have watched your lecture on the like black canon i was just about <laughs> more to say more than i should have should admit in a public space, but Ayana, you know, has has talked a lot about the black canon, and um, and I think probably since you've done that lecture, we've seen a little bit of shifts, but not the radical shifts that we that we would hope. Um, but certainly, when somebody like Jenny plays uh, Marina and says a line like, um, uh, I I don't know your line exactly, but like my I come from kings, right? My derivation is from the and like when I, every time I heard you say that and opposite of like Wayne, I was like, absolutely, this play is about the African diaspora. How can yeah. you do it any other way, <laughs> right? Like every time. Um, but Ayana, yeah, I, I always love to hear you talk about. Anything. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, I'm just gonna say, and, and I, I think, you know, I, I would be interested to hear Peter's um, thoughts too, but for a long time um, in the past, there were more opportunities in classical plays, particularly Shakespeare's, because there was an unofficial black canon. So like you, Dawn, and you, Jenny, could always be cast as a witch in Macbeth. <laughs> and you might even be able to play Lady Macbeth because that's the blackest of the, you know, like white plays. <laughs> um, and there are lots of other roles that we could name, the nurse, you know, there's a lot. Um, and so I think that was a lazy, way to cast it diversely um, and I'm hoping that we're going to change and be more intentional going forward but it does take having conversations like this one right like where people say we know what we did in the past that was not good and we should change it going forward but but, but Peter of course you're running a very different kind of company so you've been able to break all those kind of molds Exactly. Um, and, and thank you for that plug there, um, Ayana. Thank you. Um, a, a quick anecdote. I was, uh, before we all started, I spoke about um, um, The Whipping Man, the, the beautiful play by Matthew Lopez, and um, uh, Ginny's face just lit up. Um, I was doing that show in um, the Wells Theater in Virginia, and uh, I was being interviewed by a local uh, reporter, um, a, a black woman. And um, we were talking about, uh, we were just be beginning to, to, before we went on air and so on, just talking. And then we finally went on air and she asked me some, a couple of very interesting questions. And then she said, well, talk, talk to us about being the artistic director of African American Shakespeare Company. I said, yes, we've been around for 25 years. I just joined the company a few years back. Um, we, do, we do Shakespeare in, um, in color. Um, that's been our, that's our moniker, uh, you know, Shakespeare in color. And she said, before you go on, let me ask you this. Um, you, you, you're you're an African American Shakespeare company, correct? And said you you do. Sh she said, well, and this is, ladies, you and the gentlemen that are listening, this is the absolute truth. She said to me, how many times can you do Othello? I I kid you not, and I I I I made one of those you know faces that we make like, and she said, no, I'm serious. I said. Well, you, you know, we, we do more than Othello. I, I intend to do the entire canon uh, before I'm, I'm taken to that special place in the sky. And I would love to be able to direct most of the plays um, before I die. And these are, these are plays that, that are written for the world and are written for us. And uh, um, the rhythm of it is musical. And as, um, as people of color, uh, music is, is in our DNA. We, we sing, dance, we sing um, 
as as children we were taught songs and dance and, and in Trinidad and Africa we we were we were taught rhythm as a as a child we were um, and Shakespeare is all about rhythm and orchestration and it, we feel it we understand it we get it um, and I went on and on about my love for Shakespeare and the fact that we can do anything at any time and she was actually taken aback by the fact that yeah that's that's true and she felt a little weird that she asked that ridiculous question look i i was never other than the john simon i mentioned earlier i guess i was blessed that no one said i couldn't do it um when i went to england to study at the weber douglas academy now joined with another organization i had the pleasure of working with patsy roddenberg and uh she was my uh, one of my teachers then and i i would never ever forget the enthusiasm she had for theater and the, for Shakespeare and the language of it. And never once did she tell me that um, that something was wrong. She, she told me how to do it better, but she never told me something was wrong. She, Edith, the great Edith Skinner at Juilliard, um, she was tough, but she was fair. And she did, she, she made us feel, she empowered us, the entire class. Uh, she empowered us to speak better and, and be proud of our language and be proud of uh, being able to speak this language so beautifully. Um, and that also inspired me as a young actor and certainly as a young mentor of young people as well. Um, so I, I and, and, and at African American Shakespeare Company, we, we try to employ um, young actors uh, who are coming out of universities and, uh, and um, conservatories. And we say, yeah, come, come through with us. We, we are here for you. We're going to give you this opportunity to play Oberon, to play Aaron, to play, um, um, uh, my God, the Scotsman in the Scottish play. I'm still superstitious, sorry. Um, to play all these roles. We're going to give you that opportunity. It's there for you. It's, it's, it's yours to play. And, you know, I read a question earlier in the question and answer. And you, you all should look at that question, by the way. Um, please do. It's, in, it's an interesting question in the Q&A. Ayana, you've read it. Um, uh, uh, and and we do Shakespeare not as white actors playing these English characters. We play it as we are. We play it so that people in the audience can say, That's, that looks like my uncle, that guy talks like my, this guy behaves like my... So it's not about, it's not about black actors playing white roles. It's black actors creating, African-American actors creating these, recreating these great roles. And I'll, I'll close with this. Um, when people say break a leg, um, I, someone years ago told me this. Um, she said, um, you know, when you break a leg, you know, there are lots of things when you bow, break your knee, or when you make the cuff of your pants or whatever these other folkloric things are. But the, the best thing I heard was uh, the word legend begins with L-E-G. And it was always break a legend, be better than the person that played it before you. And to me, that inspired me even more to just be better and better and better than the people that played it before you, no matter what that role is. And that is why I'm still here today, because I was I was I was fueled by that desire uh, to to be always be better, always try to. My favorite quote is perfection is unattainable, but if you chase perfection, you might catch excellence. And that is that's that's another thing that I, I, I constantly live by. Sort of circling back to the question I asked before, but maybe coming out a different way. Um, when you think about your experience as, as, as experience, does the, um, the we see white American theater um, uh, treatise does that resonate with you, or, or, or do you feel as though things are getting better? Just there's less barriers, there's more more embrace of color conscious as opposed to color blind. Or, I just wonder how you're how you're feeling about that at this particular moment. Of course, this is a difficult moment because there's no. Yeah. You know what I mean? Does that does that question make sense? Uh, yeah, I think uh, kind of like Don said earlier with regards to this question too. I also think that that is incredibly nuanced, and it depends on uh, who you're who you're talking to. You know, all of us as as black artists, you know, we all carry different baggage with us and. It's just it's different if you're an actor, you know, who's a who's a part of the the theater machine. It's it's different than if you're a director or a producer or uh, a designer. Um, I think that for myself, I am heartened 
by the We See You movement. Um, and I think that comes with a few caveats. On the whole, I appreciate that we are finally in this day and age taking the time to address the uh, the inequalities and the kind of um, poor theatrical practices that we've just kind of glossed over for the past few decades. We don't really talk about it. Um, certainly there have been, uh, to my taste, I think there have been huge leaps forward in terms of color conscious casting. Um, and I think there's always room to grow, right? Um, and I appreciate movements like We See You as a catalyst to bring about that change, to have these conversations and to bring these very important issues forward. Um, I think where I kind of hesitate is um, I don't I don't want people to be, I don't know, I, I'm sorry, my, I, my COVID brain, I have like the attention span of a gnat thanks to all of this time indoors. So keeping track of my turn, if that was a little tricky. Um, but I, I love where the movement is taking us. And I guess my only reservation is I don't want us to come to a place where we are only focused on matters of color and theater because there is definitely work to be done, but we are more than the appearance of our skin. We can do it all. Um, and I think that our, our, our color and our culture and our heritage is such a boom to us. Um, I don't ever want it to be seen as something that will, you know, hold us back or uh, kind of pigeonhole us for, you know, <laughs> fat, sassy nurse and, <laughs> and Romeo and Juliet or, or what have you. <laughs> I hope some of that made sense. <laughs> Juliet's sassy friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that I, I, I was deeply appreciative of We See You, uh, White American Theater, because I think it articulated um, in, in, in very clear, coherent terms what's been the problem and ways to solve it. I think, at least with the, the, the several theater companies that I've been working with uh, during, uh, well, pre and, and during pandemic, there's a lot of goodwill to change, but it is, you know, we have no idea what will happen to that will once the theaters actually open and once, you know, once money is involved again. <laughs> right now there's no money, so people are like dreaming things. But then once there is money, like, oh, it's gonna have to like, oh, we, we thought we wanted to do this, but actually we have to pay this white guy again because he's a good white guy. And so I, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm cautious because I, I know there can be a lot of backsliding even when the intentions are good. Yeah, I would, I would echo both of my friends here. I think it is um, uh, nuanced and there is a lot of like, we will have to see over time. I am very grateful for the We See You for the very, very reasons that have been articulated. It shed a light on things that I felt like I had been experiencing. Um, and I'm very, very, very excited to see so many theaters out there doing the work. Um, as a result, I suspect in the last year, I've been on so many Shakespeare panels, these, these exact Shakespeare for BIPOC folk conversations. I've done more in the past year than I've done in all my years prior. Um, and I'll be eager to see if that translates to work. I think, you know, Sometimes we stick the actors out in front and think that our work is done. So for me, as a director, um, there's still a lot of white men that are acting as gatekeepers. Um, and, you know, that's why I've had such gratitude for African-American Shakespeare being in my community for some 20 years. And Terry Young, the founder, is somebody I looked to when I was a very young woman as like a beacon of hope. And, and that she and Peter, you know, have hired me to work over there has been really great but that's like one, you know? <laughs> um, and so and so I think we'll see. We just will have to see what happens over time. Um, we're not producing theater, like Ayana said, there's not a lot of uh, money right now. I've been very busy during the pandemic, very, very, very busy. I've, ha I've had the great fortune of being a working director. I've not been asked to do a single Shakespeare. Now, I don't know if that's because that's not what people wanna watch from their living rooms. And it might not be because it already exists, right? Like really well produced Shakespeare, we can already watch on our TVs. So maybe we don't need like Zoom Shakespeare right now. Um, but I'm doing a lot of these panels. 
but those theaters aren't offering me gigs. So we just we just have to wait and see. But um, but I am gonna assume good will until I learn otherwise um, about particular specific organizations. I was lucky enough, very briefly, I was lucky enough to have done a couple of uh, Shakespeare's on Zoom uh, here with American Stage and also with African American Shakespeare Company. We did Twelfth Night, an hour, it was an hour long version. It was not the entire thing. So that's a caveat right there. We also did, um, uh, we did Twelfth Night, we did Othello. I played Othello on, um, there's nothing strange, more strange than performing, like doing a run through of Othello, uh, 7 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. I would, it, anyway, uh, I, I still I still haven't gotten over that. Um, I've done readings of Henry V. So we, and as as Don said, I've been very busy over the COVID as well. Thank God. Um, uh, but there's still a, there's still a thirst for it. There is still a need for it. There's still a desire for it. And granted, there are some of Shakespeare's plays and and by nodding of heads uh, uh, that you know that we could veer away from for a little while. I, I think. You know, Taming of the Shrew, I think we could not, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I think, you know, that sort of treatment to, to Kate and all that, unless you have an incredible conceptualization, or maybe, maybe a, a woman playing Petruchio, that would be interesting. And, and, and you know, but it's, it's, yeah, we can, we can bypass that. So there are a few, there are a handful that I'm saying, okay, enough of that. Uh, but, the, but most of them are still there for us to do. Um, um, the, 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 the thing, what I'm trying to do constantly is to get that new generation. We all spoke of who influenced us when we were young. We all spoke about that teacher, that that mentor, that, uh, you know, Tommy, who I, I, I love Tommy Gomez. Please, next time you speak, give him my best. Um, but, um, you know, I, I want to make sure that we continue to influence the young people. I directed a, a production of, of uh, the Scottish play, um, rewritten, uh, reconceptualized by Magdalia Cruz. Um, uh, a wonderful piece, right? Yay! Um, play and on, play on. Play on, baby, play on. Play on. I, was, I, was, uh, I was on the fence. I was on the fence of that when that first came out. Now I'm all for it. Um, but um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, you, I mean, what? Shane Shakespeare? Oh, are you nuts? Um, uh, but then um, we did it. And, and my first preview, because um, I had rap music, I had, you know, um, uh, uh, poetry. Um, uh, it was, it was, it was quite wonderful. It was a homeless encampment in San Francisco. It was really beautiful. And um, the, the, my first in, uh, uh, audience was about eighty-five high school kids, and I sat two hours, no intermission, and I sat in the back row, and I said to myself, I said, the first cell phone glow. You know that glow of the cell phone when you in the first glow I failed. And I gave myself that bar, that bar, that high of a bar. I said, the first phone that gets pulled out, I have failed what I wanted to do. And for two hours straight, not one cell phone got popped up. And I thought to myself, okay, this is great. And they were talking about, I didn't, man, this was Shakespeare. Holy cow. I loved it. I understood so much more of it. Wow. The chick, that, that dude, when that dude came out with the headset, man, that Malcolm dude, because he didn't want to listen to nobody's SHIT. Yeah, man, that was cool, you know? And I thought, yeah, that's it. So I'm hoping that out of that 85 students or so, four or five or even one walks away with that new knowledge, that desire to go read it that desire to go read maybe Romeo and Juliet, maybe Othello, maybe whatever. And that is that is what I live for. That is why I think uh, we are all here to just keep influencing influencing the young folks that, that come up afterwards, that will be on panels like this in 10 years and say, oh yeah, I remember when Don Monique Williams directed, oh, da, 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 da. yeah. And that's, I think that's what we are all there for. And I'm, that thrills me more than anything in the world. I'd be curious to know, and I, I don't I hope I'm not overreaching here. Um, you're asking an impertinent question, uh, but uh, Peter, given your vast experience with Cal Shakes and Don and, and Jenny at OSF, and Ayana, I know you've written very interestingly about Oregon Shakespeare Festival and, and how race is instructed in their productions. I just can't resist asking if, if you're able or willing to talk a little bit about those institutions and your experience as artists or scholars in, in interfacing with it and to what extent that has been a 
positive experience to what extent you would say maybe there's some things that still need to be worked on at those institutions is that is that am i okay asking that are you okay talking about it <laughs> okay <laughs> they all have things that they have to work on all of them there is not <laughs> one that doesn't right um but but to to connect david your question with what peter just said uh, you know that they all have things to work on because the average age at our Shakespeare institutions is still in the 60s. Yes. 60s. We're doing something wrong. Clearly, we're doing something wrong if w we cannot lower the average age of the audience in the Shakespeare theater. Um, Absolutely. Here, 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 here. Um, I totally agree with that. There's um, there's something wrong when when uh, um, I I go look. Um, I, I've I've worked at I was an associate artist at Cal Shakes for 23 years. I loved it, Michael. Michael Addison, thank you so much for giving me that opportunity to come through at Cal, at Cal Shakes. My first show there was Laertes with the wonderful Robert Sicular. Um, I, I, you may all know Robert. Anyway, um, uh, so and, and and looking out at that audience, and yes, we would have the student matinees, absolutely, which is all students, which is great. But you're right, Ayana, that that audience um, needs to be needs to grow younger, because that is who we will be working for in the future. Um, um, and yes, it's nice to have that. That's that's. 60 year old 70 year old in the front row with the text <laughs> you guys we had a lot of that at cow shakes we would you know in the front row with the with the book and the thick glasses and until we cut something or or cut and paste something the pages will turn and they wouldn't know where they are um but we we do that's they all need to do something wrong and just do something better um cow shakes has done a great deal over the years um, uh, African American Shakespeare Company has done wonderfully over the years. I'm sure Oregon has. Everyone is working, but everyone needs to make sure that we that we still fuel the fire of the youth. Um, without without that, we will disappear. Yeah, Cal Shakes is the first place where I saw a black actor in a Shakespeare play. So I have been going to Cal Shakes for a very long time. Um, years before I ever worked at OSF. Um, so I have a sort of a, like fond nostalgia for it while knowing also at the same time that like the number of black directors that had ever worked at Cal Shake, the number of black women directors, I mean, it was, it was like nil until, um, until, um, you know, like when, um, when uh, Liesl did Hamlet and you all did Spunk with Patricia, that was like the first that's right. Um, and that was, you know, that's in really recent memory. That's right. um, and with the leadership change there, I mean, I've seen like a lot of things shift and it's very promising. And I and I even, you know, hat tip to Jonathan Moscone, who told me, you know, directly to my face that he was somebody who never believed in term limits as a politician's son, but realized that the work that needed to happen at Cal Shakes, he was not the person to do it. Um, and so with with dignity and grace um, stepped down and aside so that um, a new thought leader could, could come in and really make some shifts. Um, and that's my buddy, Eric Teen, who I adore. Um, so, so yeah, they they all have work to do, but it's nice to see them doing the work. And I only ever went to Oregon Shakespeare Festival because I thought that they were um, setting um, like a like a national standard. And of course, once you see how the sausage is made, you're like, oh, this is how the sausage is made. But still, you know, to think about the young people that you talk about, Peter, to think about the, the student audiences that got to see Jenny as Marina, that got to see Christiana Clark as Beatrice. Uh, I mean, the, and, and that OSF has been doing this for years and years and years and, and not in a refined way. I mean, at first it's like, yeah, we like, you know, we'll stick in a two black people here and on to the next. And so it's it's an evolutionary thing, but but I really, um, you know, I worked on many a Shakespeare play there um, and I, it was a great point of pride for me to, to work at OSF, um, knowing that like, oh, we're still really effing up and effing up a lot and regularly. And like, Ayana's heard me talk about, I was the production dramaturg on the 2018 Othello and Ayana's heard me talk about how like, Oh, I think maybe, yeah, I think maybe we didn't, 
like maybe we didn't um, nail it on that one. Like maybe we actually kind of undermined um, ourselves by making some of the choices because we were trying to be like so radical or, you know. So, uh, so there's plenty of work to be, be done, but these are institutions that I think, especially in this moment with Eric and Nataki at the hell, I mean, like these are organizations that are bearing down to do that good work. Um, so I'm, I'm still a fan, um, very much. Absolutely. I know that I am. I mean, listen, when I, <laughs> when I got to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, I, I had never heard of it before I got there. I had no idea what I was in for when they sent me my contract offer. Um, I, I thought that there was a mistake because of the fact that they were like, yes, we're running from April to October. And I was like, what? And also you want me to play Cinderella? Are you aware that I'm not white? And I literally, I thought I was like, do they, do they know? Like, <laughs> cause I've never seen they it. Know. They, they know. know. They know. They know. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> right. Uh, but I mean, I, I can say without any doubt or hesitation that my time at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival changed my life. It changed me as a person. It changed me as an artist. Um, I just, it opened my mind to possibilities. I didn't even think of dreaming up. Um, and I think that says a tremendous amount about the work that they do put in uh, to, to have these conversations and to really put, you know, artists of color at the forefront of, of these movements and at the forefront of their work um, and just inviting us to the table. You know, I don't, that's, I think that's, that's all I'll speak for myself. That's all I can, that I truly hope for, for all of my BIPOC artists that we have the same seat at the table as everyone else. And I think OSF was the first institution where I saw that in action. Um, what I loved, uh, especially being a part of Pericles, um, was that, you know, I got to be a, a black biracial actor on that stage as the stage daughter of a biracial couple and an interracial couple. That reflects my life. I have a black father and a white mother, and I've never been able to be a part of that family dynamic on stage. That was the first time, and I've been, you know, acting professionally since 2008. So it was, it was really interesting to be able to do that and to have, I, there were plenty of, uh, of black women and other biracial women that were coming to me. I remember very specifically this one 16 year old girl, we're still in contact on social media. We check in with each other. Um, and she said, thank you so much. I saw Pericles. I've never seen myself on stage before I saw you in this production. And I just, it was all I could do to keep her crying <laughs> because it was like, oh, this is, this is so amazing and so freeing and so encouraging. And I only want this for other artists coming up after us. Um, and, you know, there are definitely <laughs> ways to improve as well. <laughs> I think, Dawn, you bring up Othello. And um, I remember there was that was a huge conversation for a lot of the company members at OSF uh, in terms of what are they going to be doing with this? Do we really want to see another, you know, Othello in 2018? Like, do we need that right now? Um, and I know a lot of us were interested in maybe seeing you right, <laughs> right, Diana. Uh, a lot of us were interested in seeing, well, what happens if, you know, if everyone in that production is black and we, you know, talk about a colorism issue because that is, you know, alive along the black community and that got dismissed out of hand. And what we kind of ended up with was like sort of the same thing that most every other production has done. Uh, <laughs> Everyone in it was fabulous, but... But with accents. <laughs> with accents, with accents and a few more brown people here and there. Um, you know, I remember there was a time, one of the productions I did, I was having a conversation with a designer and this was in the midst of our big push um, to talk about equity, diversity, inclusion. And I had a designer, uh, a white designer, um, talking to me about a wig uh, that they wanted to do in this particular piece. And they were, they said, okay, now for this look, we want you to have dreads because your character is kind of wild now and kind of, and I said, <laughs> like, you know, this is problematic, right? Like we have to have this conversation. The fact that you are associating a natural protective hairstyle with wildness and with, you know, danger. And, 
and she said something to the effect of like, well, I don't really want to have a conversation about, you know, black hair and politics right now. And I was like, oh, oh, but you have to. This is fun. <laughs> um, and, you know, there, there are things that happen like that. Um, but, you know, there's, there's always room to grow and room for improvement. And I will say to that designer's um, in that designer's favor that they did eventually sit down with me and we had a one-on-one -on -one, you know, with stage management involved and she listened to what I had to say and she came away from that conversation thanking me and saying, okay, you know what, I understand what was wrong with that now. Thank you for, you know, taking the time to share that with me. Let's change this to make you, you know, more comfortable and to make this design not racist. And it was like, you know what, thank you. Thank you for sitting down and having that conversation. So there's there's always room for improvement, but as long as there are people like that in the world that are willing to sit and listen and absorb and move forward, there's hope. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. I was just going to say, thank, I mean, thank you for that. That's wonderful. Uh, we're kind of running down here. I was just wondering if, should we take the, it looks like we have two questions. Uh, do you want to turn to those? Yes, last. It seemed like you were about to say something, though, Peter, so I don't want to cut you well, off. Well, no, the, the, as, as far as change is concerned, very briefly, as far as change is concerned, and this is not a Shakespeare story, but I directed uh, Kat and Nahatin Roof, speaking of Tennessee Williams, I think one of us spoke of Tennessee Williams earlier, and I directed Kat and Nahatin Roof at my theater company, and uh, uh, this woman, this white woman, uh, came up to me afterwards, and to me, theater is like church, you know, the pastor is always at the door shaking hands as people come in, <laughs> shaking hands, and they, that's what I do, so... Uh, she comes out, she took my hand and she squoze, She squeezed my hand tightly. She said, I thoroughly love this. Oh my gosh, I love it. I had the pleasure of seeing Karen Mahatin Roof in London with a black cast. I saw it on Broadway with the wonderful Anika Noni Rose and she was, she was wonderful. And now I'm seeing this wonderful black cast. She, she looked at me very earnestly and she said, do you think this play can be done with white actors? So... <laughs> So I said, you know, mm, I don't know. Let me, we should give that a try. But, um, <laughs> you know, and I've, I've encountered that throughout my career. I, I played Dr. Treves in The Elephant Man, and uh, during a talk back, a woman complimented the work, and then she said, uh, I didn't know Dr. Treves was a black man. <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, actually, yeah, yeah. You know, I, you know it's like, so I know that, that there's a shift happening um, uh, how broad the ship is, 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 is what we should talk about and what we should plan on, on broadening. But th there is a ship happening. And I, and I, I strongly believe that. And, and Jenny, you, you were, you're absolutely right. Sorry, David. No, no problem. That was a great story. Well, we have just a few minutes. To, uh, you can see the questions, I guess. Would you like to address them or one of them maybe? Let me read, let me read this one. And um, in, in your experience in productions, what conversations and choices happen around Shakespeare's imagery of darkness and African Ethiop as negative compared to light, which shows up in so many places? It's interesting. I remember... <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead, Jenny. No, no, I was, no. Please. Well, I just was gonna say that I am, of one of these like contradictory type of people because I use those references to prove one point. And then depending on like if when I'm directing, I might excise some of them to prove another point. So I, the very first Shakespeare role I ever played was Hermia back in when wow. Tommy was my teacher and he calls her a tawny tartar. He calls her an Ethiope. He calls her a, a dwarf. And um, I don't have the condition of dwarfism, but I'm Le Petite. And so for me, I was like, see, this part was actually written for somebody who's my color. I am tawny. This is, you know, so I used it as this like proof that like we already exist in the world of Shakespeare, not just the, well, how many times can you do Othello or how many yes. times can you do Titus? You yes. know, like Rosalind in um, 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 Love's Labors, right? And they talk about, you know, so for me, I sometimes like, as the academic me sort of leans into like, this is evidence. Uh, but then the director me tries to behave with some care. So like when I directed Romeo and Juliet, everywhere where black was a substitute for evil, I took it out and I used dark or I used evil or, I, you know, and I tried to keep it so that it would still scan. But when black was code word for something bad, I changed it. Um, when it was just a poetic word, I would, 
leave it or if it felt like a actual useful descriptor like in a fellow like when he says black is mine own skin i leave it because mm-hmm. for me it's like see, see? Yep. but um, so there so i don't have a singular approach to it i i uh, i both appreciate that it's there and academically sometimes really lean in um and then conceptually it really depends on um the, the kind of uh, aim of the production or casting as well. Yep. Yeah, I think to your point, that's what I was going to bring up is uh, Love's Labor's Loss. Um, having done that production at OSF and also Chicago Shakespeare and was slated to do it <laughs> uh, in New York uh, this past year, but thanks, Corona. Um, so that is a conversation that we had with both, both versions of that production, um, especially because in the second one I was playing Rosalind. So, or Rosalind. So um, we ended up just removing all the references to, you know, Ethiopian and dark and but just, and purely because it's a, it's a, an aged reference. Not everything in Shakespeare's works age well. I mean, hello, Merchant of Venice. Hello. Um, you know, <laughs> we just, <laughs> bye. Um, so, you know, we, we cut it because contextually it doesn't make sense in, in but you know what also needs to be cut are all the references to fairness being the ideal. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, if, if we're going to cut, which I think we should, the, you know, kind of locating blackness as ugly, undesirable, yeah. evil, then I think that all the references to fair and beauty and goodness and purity are equally problematic, at least for me. And I, I you know, I would love to see a production that just like <laughs> takes all that out too. Yeah, I I agree. Um, I I do have a concept in my mind for Merchant of Venice with a black Ethiopian Jew. Um, it's 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 something that's percolating, been percolating for a little while. Someone's mentioned that to me like nine years ago, and it's been percolating for a while. But yeah, there there are these plays that are just you know let's, and I do the same thing, exactly the same thing that Don spoke about, that Jenny spoke about, uh, just ex- excising those 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 catchphrases, those triggers, um, I, we don't, we don't necessarily need them today. I know we're running late on time here, but I think we do have to uh, end that we always try to end on time if we can. And even though I'm sure all of us, myself included, would like this to go on. Uh, we could have and so I, I want to thank each of you very much for taking part in this panel discussion and for saying so many wise and insightful things. Uh, I deeply enjoyed it. And I'm sure everybody who was who attended did as well. And I'm not, it's also going to be recorded. It has been recorded, so it will live on. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you, David. Thank you, Thank you, David. you so much, David. What a pleasure. Thank so you. good to see nice. you all again. Oh, my time. Thank you, Dawn. I, we'll be on another Zoom, I'm sure, Dawn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Jenny, nice so, meeting you. Ayana, nice meeting you. Nice Dawn, meeting keep you. up the great work, everybody. Yes, David, yes. thank you again. Be Cheers. Safe. Thank you. <laughs>